Well, Spain is a very big country, so um, what I'm going to do um, today is cover the, I'm going to start with like the most popular destinations and the day trips there and sort of work the list down to, you know, from most popular to maybe more obscure. So Spain is the second favorite destination for Americans. Um, after France, and it's a very diverse country with lots of history, um, culture, great food, great wine. But Spain is very regional, so every the look and feel of every um, different region in Spain, whether you're in the Basque Country or you're in the south in Andalusia, and we're going to see a map in just a second. <clears throat> whether you're in Catalonia, where Barcelona is. Um, it's, it all feels very, very different. The architecture changes, the food changes, and uh, the, even the food names in Spanish change a little bit. So what I call beans in one city, it's actually called something else, or it means something else in, in, in a different uh, city. So it's, it's quite interesting. So it's very, very regional. Um, we're going to, so here's a little map of Spain and we're going to um you know start with madrid or barcelona and then you know say see some of the day trips and then madrid we're going to do uh, the southern part of spain where i'm from andalucia so i grew up here in seville I was born and raised there um and then we're going to see the north the basque country la rioja which is the you know the most well-known wine region in in spain all the way up to Galicia, where the El Camino de Santiago finishes. So let me start with Barcelona. So Barcelona is here on the East Coast, and it's the capital of this um, state or region of Spain uh, called Catalonia. And um, so it's very cosmopolitan, it's very modern. Um, it's got its origins in the textile revolution uh, and it's became a center for the art and artist in spain um, especially in the last century and, and it's very rich in in culture in culture and history and eclectic as well in its architecture and it's always been in the sort of avant-garde of art and fashion so some of my favorite places in Barcelona are, for example, the Gothic Quarter, which is downtown. And it's, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's very medieval. So, you know, you've got the wrought iron, you know, um, on the windows and, and this, you know, this sort of fairy tale um, bridge here in between the buildings. So it's definitely a must see in Barcelona. And something that is lesser known is that underneath the Museum of the City, which is what you see here on the top, you can go down and there's this Roman ruins, um, you know, from the Roman origins of the city that you can actually walk through and, and see some of the, you know, the, the layouts of the buildings and things like that. <clears throat> so throughout this, I'm going to try to show you, you know, things that are not necessarily what you would find in a travel guide. So I want to give you sort of the inside secrets and, and, and things like that. So everybody knows, um, Gaudi is one of the, um, you know, it's got all these buildings throughout, uh, Barcelona, like Sagrada Familia, Casa Bayo. And, but I want to talk to you about it, another, of uh, gaudy building that it's actually more lesser known but it's just as beautiful and it's accessible for travelers which is this torre Belasgar, which you see you see here so this one is very different than these other buildings because in this building he tried to do a tribute to uh, gothic type architecture so it's actually an early work by gaudy and it's got this, you know, beautiful park around it and um, wonderful building. Bellis Guard means beautiful view. And it's, a, you know, it's a modernist uh, manor house. Um, the, he designed it and, and built it in the 1900s and it was opened in 1909. Um, so it was a residence for his um, uh, clients. I forget the family name right now. But, uh, you know, today is you can visit it. Another really cool 
um, thing that you can do and see that some lots of people uh, skip uh, when you go to Barcelona is you can take a day trip to the monastery of Montserrat. The word Montserrat means serrated edge. So you can see this mountain that the monastery is on. So the monastery is kind of like just like hanging off of um, this mountain and it's uh, where you see oh, everything around the mountain is a national park park. So you it's all, you know, nature and greenery and it's beautiful. This is a ninth century monastery um, and it's home. It's home to one of the oldest boy choirs in Europe dating from the 14th century and you can still come and listen to the choir um, every week another really really fun thing to do in barcelona is is a cooking class there's you know plenty of um, suppliers that do cooking classes there and it's a great way i think to get to know a country and a culture is by trying to understand the food and the you know what makes excited you know the culture excited about its food and i will tell you that for us uh spaniards the you know food is a central part of 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 the life and 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 you know we like to party we like to get together with people we like to eat food um and you know things like that so i and i also want to talk to you about like one piece of um, one typical food in each one of the regions that we're going to look at uh, that you might not know of that I would suggest you try if you happen to be there. So this is arroz negro or black rice. Uh, it's made with, you know, regular rice with squid or cuttlefish and then squid ink, which gives us this dark and, you know, color to it. Um, but you know, don't, don't, it's actually very delicious. You usually you eat it with a little aioli um, together with it. It's got lots of garlic, onions, fish stock, peppers, olive oil, and sweet uh, paprika as well. And some chefs will add, like you see in this picture, um, seafood into the paella pan, like shrimp or crab. Another great um, day trip from um, Barcelona is two different wine regions. One, uh, Penedes, which is south of uh, Barcelona, and it's home to all the Cava wines and sparkling wines. They do have some dry reds and whites as well, and, and some dessert wines. And most of the historic wine states are located in what we call Macias, which is the Catalan farmhouses. And then the Priorat region, which is around Montserrat. Um, it's a very small wine region in Catalonia, which is known for is uh, intensely flavored like red wines. Uh, and you can actually find Priorat wines here in the US. So you can, you know, get a taste for, you know, if that's you're more into reds and you want to do some wine um, tourism, then I would recommend the Priorat. If you want to do the sparkling wines, definitely do the Penedès. North of Barcelona, there's a part of, um, you know, of Catalonia that doesn't get as uh, visited by Americans, and it's a, it's a, it's a bummer because it's a beautiful area. It's the Costa Brava. This is where um, Dali uh, resided and and uh, did a lot of his painting. So it's known as the Tuscany of Catalonia, and it's a quiet place of great natural beauty. It's famous for this, you know, amazing coast, medieval villages, and it's it's a very rugged sort of coast. Um, you can visit Figueres, where the Dali Museum and theater are, which is the largest surrealistic object in the world. The building is in itself a work of art, which uh, it's the old theater um, from the town that was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s and um, it houses all the famous works of Dali and there's a lot of different fishing towns along the way like this one that you see in this picture where it's great you can stop and um, they're small quaint you can get some really real local food hey hey Zeus this is Cindy are are these areas you say good day trips from Barcelona or would you yes. recommend Okay. Well, if you really, 
want to explore Costa Brava, it makes more sense to, you can either do a day trip, but then you're just going to see one thing or one, one uh, town. But if you do want to enjoy, um, like really explore it, I recommend staying in Costa Brava because you're, otherwise you're going to be in the car for an hour and a half each way every day. Um, so it's, it'd be better to stay. So Girona is also, um, in this region, it's also, it has a lot of Jewish history, um, for those who are interested in that. Uh, and then Lampor da Neto, Lampor da, which is, you know, this area with all these little medieval villages, um, where you can stroll through small streets and, you know, discover all the, you know, feel the history and the charm of, of the villages and the architecture that you can see in this picture. This is really interesting to me. I, I mean, I like hiking and it's, uh, there is this Camino de Ronda, which is a coastal path that follows the rugged coastline that you see in the picture of Costa Brava. It's a historical path that was created with the idea of communicating the different towns, the different um, beaches and coves of the coast, so that it also guaranteed to the fishermen and sailors that they could get back home if they had any sort of shipwreck or uh, against the rocks or any sort of issues. There was a path that they could take and get home. And also it was used to control like the contraband and things like that. Today, it's a great to, uh, way to explore sort of this wilder side of the Costa Brava. And then as you hike through it, you, you'll see rugged headlands, caves, fishing, fishing villages, sandy beaches. It's great. Um, another great two ways to uh, see uh, this part of Catalonia is from the air on like a you know small airplane because again this coast is just so beautiful. So you know either see it uh, up from the air with uh, with an airplane or you could you can also do is very typical to go sailing around it and then you can go into some of the smaller caves and things like that if you are into diving there's actually um this is a, a famous place for divers the medes islands um are one of the most incredible spots of costa brava it's a small archipelago and it's a protected marine area of seven uh, islands, islets, um, just about a mile away from the coast. And it's got really important, like, maritime flora and fauna um, in that it's the only place in the Mediterranean that you can find it. So it's it's very, um, it's a great, it's a paradise for people that, like you know, love diving and stuff. <clears throat> Another fun thing to do around here through these villages, because there's so many of them sort of strung along, is to take an e-bike and go through the different uh, medieval villages. And you might not know this, but there are volcanoes in Spain. Um, these are uh, extinct from, you know, millennia ago so as you can see they're very much covered in greenery and a great way to do this to see them this see this part is to um this is called like a rocha volcanic park and you can do it on a hot air balloon it's what what i would recommend it's uh it's a lot of fun and last but not least, um, this is a, also an area where it's a lot of fun to go kayaking. And again, you have this rugged coast with all these little, you know, coves. So it's a lot of fun to um, do it from the water. All right, so we're going to move on to the islands, the islands here in green of the Baleares. <clears throat> and this is uh, Mallorca. Mallorca is home, which is the biggest one of, of them all, this uh, large green one. Um, so it's home to, you know, very quaint, gorgeous stone villages. You know, I hope you can see like every, you know, we're already seeing how each region has a very different look uh, in Spain. So, and again, here you're going to see, you know, coves with turquoise waters, 
um, you know, discover villages that are trapped in time with stone streets and, you know, adorned with flowers. This is, for example, the most, one of the more famous villages in Mallorca, um, which is Valdemosa village. Um, it's a little mountain village in the Serra Tramontana, uh, which is one of the most charming in the whole island with, you know, narrow streets like you see here, you know, all made of rock and stone and lots of flowers, um, sand colored buildings. It, the village has like 2,000 inhabitants and um, it's it's just, you know, it's perched at a height of 1300 feet above sea level. So it's it, just the road to get to it is, is, is beautiful. Oops, sorry. And um, then, like I said, Mallorca has a lot of um, different coves and <clears throat> it's kind of an interesting thing, an interesting island because depending on the type of traveler that you are, you would go to a different part of the island. So for example, um, the Southwest of the island, there's a lot of adults only resorts, so no children. Whereas the North East of the island, you got all the all inclusives with lots of families with children. And then if you wanna be sort of secluded, you would go to the North um, East. And, and it's like very like sort of, um, you know, it's like an escape into nature from from the urban life, so it's it's an interesting uh, island how it's it's all set up in different parts, but anyways, but there's lots of uh, calas or coves where you can see the turquoise Mediterranean waters and the white sandy beaches. Mallorca is also a great place to do uh, to go sailing, you know, with a skipper and some lunch. Um, that's a great fun activity to do. And I told you I was going to tell you about a little bit of food at each place. Um, and then, well, we eat a lot of rice everywhere in Spain, but especially in this area in the Mediterranean, you know, between um, Catalonia and Valencia and then Mallorca, which are the three uh, regions that they all speak Catalan in a version or another. There's a lot of rice and you can never go wrong eating rice in this area. This is a different kind. It's sort of more of a soupy. It's called uh, arroz brut. And it's made with a combination of onions, tomatoes, rice, mushroom, piece, pieces of meat such as chicken or rabbit, and vegetables like peas, red peppers, green beans. The name of the dish means dirty rice. And it's always prepared with excess water so that it remains soupy. And then it's got uh, lots of spices, paprika, um, saffron, cinnamon, nutmeg, and pepper. All right, hope you're all getting hungry. Now we're gonna move inland. <clears throat> we're gonna go to Madrid. Uh, Madrid is currently the capital of Spain, but it's only been the capital of Spain since 1561. We're gonna see the, the true longstanding capital or previous capital of Spain in a little bit. But this is, um, you know, obviously, bustling city with lots of activities, lots to do. Um, one of the, um, you know, places where you have to see if you're in Madrid, it's the Plaza Mayor, which is um, since 1621 until today, it's, it like hosts the annual, annual Christmas market. Uh, but initially it used to host like bullfights and soccer games and crowning ceremonies. Uh, and then on Sundays, it would turn into a market. Um, so today it's got, you know, it's got a portico that you can walk around and there's lots of restaurants and shops and there's always um, caricature artists there so you can get your portrait done. Another really uh, important place to visit is the Royal Palace. This was finished in 1751, and it has been the official, but not actual, residence of the kings in, in Madrid. Um, and But it's only really used for ceremony, so you can just about see it any day when you're there. And banquets, this is the dining room. It's very ornate and very elaborate. It's a mixture of uh, Baroque and neoclassical architectural styles. And as far as food, I've got two things for you in Madrid that you have to try. 
One is the chocolate con churros. So our churros are different than what you find here in, in the US. They're actually not um, sweet by themselves. So if you, so we usually dip them in hot chocolate and our hot chocolate, as you can see, is very, very, very thick. You can almost make the churro stand on the, uh, on the little teacup there. So this is um, definitely a, a must stop in, in Madrid. They've got some of the best uh, churros in the whole country. And the other thing you have to try is the cocido madrileño, which is a chickpea and meat stew that it's it's great in winter, but it's, you know, comfort food for the winter, but but it's actually served all uh, year long and it simmers for hours and it's just just a little, little bit of heat. Um, so the chickpeas are super tender and, you know, it's got chorizo and things like that. Now, a great day trip is historically the 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 real capital of spain which is toledo toledo is a medieval city that is just absolutely a must-see and beautiful so toledo was the capital of spain for about a thousand years and it's called the city of three cultures because if it's jewish um muslim and christian heritage and how the three cultures live together the um, the old city is located on a mountain top, as you can see here, uh, with a 150 degree view uh, of the surrounding area um, because it's it's in the bend of the Tagus River. Now, the Tagus River is the one that ends in Lisbon. And it, so the little contains like many historical sites, including the Alcázar, which you see here in Spanish. Alcázar means the uh, castle or palace. So this is the main palace, and then it's got a great cathedral. Um, then it's got a zoko or you know old style of sort of market, central marketplace, and it's medieval network of narrow streets. Really interesting. It's got all these underground passages because during um, the Muslim occupation, the Jewish wanted to congregate to to worship or to congregate they built all these tunnels underneath their homes so they can go from one home to the other home to the other home and and congregate so now nowadays all these are you can visit them and they've a lot of them they've been turned into like sort of sellers or or um, some of the stores will have some of their merchandise in the tunnel that you know connected to another building that's quite interesting and Toledo is known for a lot of traditional crafts. If you have a chance to, to, if you happen to be in Madrid, you have to visit Toledo because a lot of the different arts and crafts that are done there, I, you know, I wonder how long they'll survive because they take months and months and months and there's just not enough money to charge for, for what they do. So they do a lot of sort of filigree kind of work and also steel, you know, they used to make, uh, Toledo steel is very famous, and so they, they make a lot of uh, swords and, and things like that. So here's a picture of the narrow streets and the um, buildings. Another stop from Madrid, um, it's Segovia, and it's got a lot of very interesting monuments. The Roman aqueduct is the one that is most famous. We're gonna see a picture of that in a minute. But it's also got this really interesting Alcázar or Royal Palace um, because it's very, it's not the typical sort of design that you find in Spain. This is, reminds you more of maybe some of the, uh, the palaces that you would see in Germany. Um, so, it's got several Romanesque churches and several noble palaces from the 15th and 16th century. So if you like, you know, Gothic architecture and, and, and things like that, this is a great place to see. But obviously most people come here for the Roman aqueduct, which was built in 50 BC. And it's still remarkably well-preserved. And it's an impressive construction with two tiers of arches. Um, and it's like right there in downtown of the city. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, like I said, it's in an excellent state of conservation. 
and and it's the great sort of mixture between the modern you know 16th century architecture of the rest of the city and this thing this aqueduct from 50 bc now what are you going to eat in segovia you're going to eat suckling pig that it's so soft that the um the chef for the waiter will actually cut it prepare it for you in front of you with a plate so you don't need a you don't need a knife you just need a plate to cut it because it's so it's just very very soft in the technique that they use another um day trip uh, from madrid is avila which is outstanding example of a fortified city from the middle ages and the surrounding walls are still intact so avila alone in spain has kept its surrounding walls which date back to um 1090 a.d in the intramuros town and the walls are surrounded you know showed like just what a magnificent medieval city it was and it's got all kinds of convents and monasteries romanesque style churches so it's this is another one really interesting now we're going to go south to to my home and my my homeland or region of spain andalusia and Andalucía is, um, and this is actually a picture of Cadiz, which is actually where my offices are in Spain. Um, but what is Andalucía? Andalucía is food, it's joy, it's it's dancing, it's jovial, warm people, uh, funny. The rest of the country thinks that we have a funny accent and uh, that we're just funny. And it's got a rich cultural history. <clears throat> First stop is going to be Sevilla or Seville, which is, like I said, my hometown. Um, this is a view from the river that crosses the, the city. Um, Sevilla is very eclectic. You're going to see Roman ruins, um, Arab architecture, medieval architecture, Gothic architecture, modern architecture. Um, there's zoning laws don't allow um, tall buildings so there's nothing over three or four stories tall and it's a very even though it's a city of a million people it's very walkable um so you 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 always get the feel of being in a small uh, town when you're in sevilla one of the places to see here this is plaza de españa which is a, a beautiful mo monument to each province in spain and if you see here, there's this uh, columns, and then on, underneath it, there's tiles. So there's um, 50 of these spots, and each one of them, it's a province in Spain. And it's uh, tiles hand-painted depicting either uh, a moment in history about that province or, or something typical about them that is representative of that province so it's a great way to go around spain uh, in a little bit so this uh, monument is actually being featured in such films as lawrence of arabia and star wars episode one the alcazar or, or you know like we mentioned which means um the palace is uh, of sevilla it was constructed in the 10th century uh, and it was a palace for the muslim uh governor and it's even it's still used today as the Spanish royal family's residence in the city when they come to visit. And it consists of a group of, of different, you know, buildings, palatial buildings and extensive gardens. And this one was where the house of trade with with the American colonies was seated, seated here. And it's actually being featured also in Lawrence of Arabia and in Game of Thrones season five. Now, I told you we like to party and dance and drink. So one of our festivals, it's, it's renowned throughout Europe. It's the Feria de Sevilla, in which for a whole week, we have a section of the city that we um, erect the structures um, and we get dressed in our um flamenco sort of attire and for a whole week we eat we drink we dance we drink some more we eat some more we dance some more so um oops there's lots of horses and the uh, parade during the day here you can see me this is actually me a few years ago 
quite a few with my mother and my horse um, back when I was a teenager. So what are you going to get in Sevilla? In Sevilla, you're going to eat croquetas, which are uh, Spanish fritters, which uh, consist of a crispy outer shell and a creamy interior. It's a bechamel inside. Um, so it's a buttery bechamel sauce where you can either um, add ham to it or chicken or fish, and then, you know, they... They put they coat it in breadcrumbs and egg wash and they're fried until golden and crunchy. And you're also going to eat langostinas, which is shrimp. The shrimp in this part of the country is well known throughout the country. Uh, people come to eat it. People ship it. It's the uh, best uh, shrimp in the in the whole country. So they're very large. So they're about this size and um, striped and they have a very full distinct flavor so much that the only the, the only thing we do is boil them and then just serve them with a little bit of cooking salt over them no sauces no spices because the meat is so tender and so full of flavor so that's a must eat over there now surrounding Sevilla there is um, the white villages which are or Pueblos Blancos, which like they scatter a, across the southern Spanish hills of Andalucía. Many were once uh, fortresses that stood between the Christian and the Moorish territories. And these uh, charming villages are known for their dramatic landscapes, always on top of a, a hill um, or a cliff, unique beauty and seclusion. So here you see, this is the town of Arcos de la Frontera, and another famous one, which you've seen from, uh, which was the picture on the beginning of this presentation, is Ronda. Ronda is very famous for being on this, just perched on this cliff. And with this Roman bridge, you know, joining both parts of it. Uh, and it's, you know, so it's on this, uh, sits atop this deep gorge and has a rich cultural and literal tradition and it's actually the home of modern bullfighting uh, it has the um the oldest bull ring in spain and ronda is surrounded by rolling hills whitewashed buildings orange trees olive groves and it's actually one of spain's oldest towns which was settled by the Celts and late, later inhabited by the Romans and Moors. As you can imagine, a town perched on this uh, gorge. And when you look at it from the other way, you could see everything, right? So it's a very um, prized sort of uh, strategic location to, to put a town, which is why so many uh, civilizations chose it. Uh, it was a favorite with the 19th century romantic travelers and artists, writers like Orson Welles, Alexander Dumas, Ernest Hemingway. They all came to Ronda. They all stayed in Ronda, sort of looking for inspiration. Of course, you can't go to Andalusia and not go to Granada. Um, <clears throat> you come to Granada to see the Alhambra, which is a 12th century Moorish um, Palatine city. And it's the only preserved city of the Islamic period in Spain. And it's, you know, rising above the modern lower town. And there's the Alhambra and the Albaicin, which is the also um, the residential district that was that, you know, back from that time. And where you also see you have a, a Zoco, you know, this traditional market. And you also have that sort of uh, history of, of the three cultures living together, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian. Um, so I think, you know, the Alhambra is a must-see uh, for everyone. It's got all this intricate, you know, beautiful architecture, all this really like um, intricate work in plaster that you can see here in the pictures that actually you could still see some of the color because this used to be um, not, this uh, sort of pale or, you know, don't think all white like the Taj Mahal. This was all colorful. It was all painted with many different colors. And you can still see some of it when you look into the ceilings and so forth. It also has lots of um, water features and, and beautiful gardens because 
you know, the people that built it came from from the north of Africa. So the the with very more complicated access to uh to water. So when they were here, you know, and when settled in southern Spain, they just you know, they just built water features everywhere. And one of the things you're gonna want to do in Granada is go to a um, flamenco show in a cave. <clears throat> so on in the Albay thing, I was mentioning how the Albay thing is this other hill that is right across from the Alhambra, where the original settlement of Granada was. So it's actually you know this hill, and it's got all these caves that um, that people use as homes, and that you know today um, they use as a flamenco shows so this is great because you the beauty of this is that instead of being how do i say it instead of being seated you know in front of a stage you're kind of surrounding the dancer which is the main the flamenco the, the way the flamenco was meant to be experienced right flamenco when we dance flamenco when we um you know have a party people just you know you put the chairs into a circle and people start, you know, clapping and singing and, you know, jumping into the middle of the dance. So this is the very authentic way to just feel the vibrations from, from the, you know, the tapping of the shoes on, on the floor. So it's, it, this is a great way to experience it. One more city in Andalucía that you can't miss is Córdoba. Uh, it's about an hour and a half north of, of Seville, and it's a period of greatest glory beginning in the 8th century after the Moorish conquest, when some 300 mosques and, and palaces and public buildings were built to actually rival the splendors of Constantinople. Damascus and Baghdad, because Cordoba was the capital of Al-Andalus, which is what the, the Moors called, you know, Andalusia back then, or where the name Andalusia comes from. So Cordoba was the capital for, for a long time. So here you're going to find more, you know, of that until it moved to Granada. So you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, great architecture like this uh, mosque that was later turned into a cathedral, which is a good thing because a lot of the times what would happen is, you know, with the reconquest, the, you know, Christians would come in and destroy with the Moors had and then build the cathedral on top. That's what happened in Sevilla. But in, in Cordoba, they respected because of the beauty of it. And they said, you know, look, we'll just put a cross, but we're going to keep this building because it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And another thing that Cordoba is famous for, if you happen to come in May, um, they have lots of flowers. They love to adorn this. This is not uh, someone's patio or, or courtyard. This is a street. So they like to adorn the outside of the homes with pots, colorful pots, and lots of flowers. So when you come for the flowers of May in Cordoba, it's quite a sight. And what are you going to eat in in Cordoba, you're gonna eat San Morejo. So if you know gazpacho, which is a cold soup of you know vegetables, lots of tomato, um, San Morejo is a very thick. It has lots of bread added to it. Um, version of gazpacho, it's actually my favorite. I would prefer San Morejo to the to gazpacho. So this is uh, from here. It's from it was invented in Cordoba. And you get served with, as you can see, some hard boiled eggs and pieces of ham sprinkled on the top. If you're a golfer, Andalucía is actually uh, great uh, for you. Uh, most of uh, Europe actually um, comes to, in the winters, they come to either train if they're professional golfers or to just vacation and play golf in, in, in all of the Costa del Sol, you know, you know, all the southern coast of Spain, Andalucía. Um, in this picture, there's it's the country club Valderrama or the golf course Valderrama, which is actually the only course outside of the UK and US that has hosted a Ryder Cup. But there's plenty, plenty of golf courses around. All right, now we're going to jump all the way to the north. 
this is to the Basque country. Um, so the Basque country, how do I describe it? It's completely different than everything you've seen already of Spain. It's very poetic, it's country roads, it's fishing villages like this one's here, it's vineyards, it's the home to Picasso, or not the home, but the, the, the place of Picasso's famous work, Guernica. Uh, it's also modern art with the Guggenheim, and it's, it's home to some of the best food in all of Spain. Um, so we're going to see a little bit of the... Uh, let me go back one. So we're going to see, so we're looking here at this blue area. That's the Basque country. And then we're going to go into this little tiny red area underneath it, which is La Rioja. All right. So this is what I mean by it's idyllic countryside. It's it's just, it's peaceful. Um, you know, you got the sheep here, you got the history, very quaint, small towns like you see, you know, here, that's a butcher shop. It's very off the beaten path. One of the um, cool towns here, cool fishing towns is Getaria. Getaria is a medieval fishing village. So you have a great contrast between very colorful houses for the fishermen in the medieval streets of the town. And this is home to a uh, wine that I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Chacoli wine. Chacoli wine is a white, um, slightly sparkling sort of a buzzing sort of uh, wine that is that grows here uh, in this particular terrain and it grows in these vineyards that are sloping down to the uh, to the ocean a very unknown place in in Spain so really off the beaten path is this little island here it's called San Juan de Gastrogache and if you are a game of thrones um fan this was the island fortress of dragonstone in game of thrones season seven um, the name means castle rock and you can see here it's got 241 man-made you know obviously steps the path the you know goes zigzagging to the church of san juan which is on the top and a very interesting fact about this little island in this church is that there are caves underneath the church where during the inquisition time they imprison the so-called witches here's another little town in the basque country just so you can see on the rivia that sort of uh contrast you know the buildings very very different than all the buildings you've been seeing in the rest of spain a um, lot of wood construction, lots of colorful houses. It's another fishing village. And then you move on to San Sebastian, which is the, it's opulent, it's sophisticated. It's got white sandy beaches, beaches luxurious mansions. Um, it was the, it's, it's very opulent because San Sebastian for a long, for a while was during the Belle Epoque, it was the summer home for the very wealthy in Europe. So they would come here to vacation. And and then lastly, you want to, you know, stop in Bilbao. Bilbao is the modern face of the Basque country. It's home to the Guggenheim Museum, which you can see here. It's kind of uh, the center of the arts in the Basque country. And it's got an interesting mix of modern uh, feel within modern sophistication with tradition at the same time. Fun thing to do here, we actually have an underwater winery, which is right off the coast of uh, Bilbao, where they age the wine in these cages into um, in, in the ocean. So they've got their whole reasoning and theory about the, uh, apparently the temperature is a lot more constant underwater. So, you know, I'm not a, a wine connoisseur or, you know, enologist, but, they swear by it and by their methods. So that's an interesting thing. You can get on the boat that they used to work and taste some of the wine. They'll bring out a, a bottle for you to taste. This is quite interesting. What are you going to eat in the Basque country? You're going to eat pinchos. Uh, pinchos is uh, what in the rest of Spain we call tapas. So it is um, small dishes that you actually pay 
by the toothpick. So some of them at the end, you'll go and you, you know, you pick the ones that look good to you, and then someone will come and count your toothpicks, and and that will be your guilt. <clears throat> Now, moving into La Rioja, which is very much connected, and if you're really into wine, it's a great trip to do, do you know, Basque Country and La Rioja together. Um, so there's lots of monasteries, not just the, the wine, there's lots of history here. So here you have the Monastery of Yuso, which is a World Heritage site. Uh, it's actually considered to be the cradle of the Spanish language. Um, and it's in this beautiful valley in La Rioja. So it dates from the 11th century, um, but it's also had some remodeling in the 16th and the 18th centuries, which means that you're going to get, um, you know, some of that eclectic uh, mixture of things between Romanesque, Greco Roman, Plateresque, Rococo styles, all sort of um, together in the same building. So here's the picture of the portico. So here in Yuso, it's considered the cradle of the Spanish language because the first pieces of literature produced in Spanish were actually written here because everything prior to this was written in Latin. But so the Spanish language was truly born here in the monastery of Yuso. Another really interesting monastery is the this one of Virache. Um, which is here you have, again, a mixture of very different styles as the monastery gets expanded and renovated. So you got medieval, Renaissance, Baroque styles. This is a Benedictine monastery of um, unknown origin, although it was first documented in the year 958 AD. And it was actually a landmark as a hospital for pilgrims doing the El Camino de Santiago. Here's a, a couple of other pictures of the monastery. I like the portico, so I've added, you know, always a few pictures of them. And now we're gonna go from, from the temples to the other kind of temples of wine. Um, this is a very interesting winery. It's um, Condes de los Andes, which is, uh, has this underground area of, of caves They've excavated them over several centuries. And Conde de los Andes caves are Rioja's most impressive underground cellar system in terms of age, architecture, and dimensions. They extend the whole kilometer in length. So it's got, you know, corridors full of history, gallery, galleries that blend in with, you know, the darkness and the vaults and the little nooks and, and, and the bottles and it's it's cool to see. So here's a couple of other pictures of the cellars. Oh, sorry. You know how they just keep going and going. Um, very interesting. Another Frank Gehry building that we have in Spain is the Hotel and Winery Marques de Riscal. Uh, you can actually buy this wine here in the U.S. too. It's a 2006 uh, Frank Gehry masterpiece which was built to house the hotel Marques de Riscal, which is also a winery. Um, it has since become a highly sought after luxury retreat. retreat. Combines design, art, cuisine, wine, and obviously the lush landscape. Um, so it's, it's a great, it's called the city of wine. And it's indeed a city of wine because you know, you've got from the fascinating hotel to the winery and, and vineyards, which you can visit. It's got several fine dining options, including a Michelin star uh, restaurant, a wine museum, and a vino therapy spa, which is a spa that uses the natural treatments that contain properties from the vine and the grape. Um, so in 1998, Marquez de Riscal pioneered the idea of combining the production space with space for leisure to create this city of wine, which aims to raise the awareness of wine, its history, its culture, and its philosophy. Another really cool winery um, in this region is La Rioja Alta. And here, five families erected this winery together in 1890 um, looking for quality, elegance, innovation, evolution. 
So they built a way of feeling the wines and producing the wines that uh, continues to evolve and adapt into new tastes. Um, they follow their own recipe based on their winemaking tradition and know-how. They make their own barrels and casks. They use manual racking and believe in long aging. And then they combine this with some of the more modern winemaking technology. So, you know, today you can find their wines all over the world and in some of the best restaurants in the world. And it's interesting how you can see how this, you got the casks here that are like buried on the ground. Um, so this is another place that it's cool to, it's a great stop. Then on the far west, we're going to stop in Santiago for a second. And this is the end of the El Camino de Santiago. But it's in itself a beautiful city to visit. Um, so it's got Romanesque and Gothic and Baroque buildings. The old town of Santiago is one of the world's most beautiful urban areas. The oldest monuments are grouped around the tomb of St. James and the cathedral. So in the beginning of the ninth century, um, a hermit called Pelagio saw a mysterious light shining over a Roman tomb that was forgotten in the middle of the forest. So very soon the news spread all over the Christian world that this was the tomb of St. James and that had been discovered in this far side near the Finisterrae, or which means in Latin, the end of the known earth. Because if you, you know, back then, this was it. You couldn't go any farther west than that. So after a few years later, the site became famous, a famous pilgrimage town from all over Europe. And that's where the El Camino de Santiago got its, its start. So the Camino de Santiago has been, you know, a meeting place for pilgrims uh, ever since it emerged 11 centuries ago. It's over 500 miles, and it's actually several different routes. It's not just one route. The two main ones are the French route, which is the most popular, and which starts in France and goes all the way to Santiago. And then also the northern route, which is the most difficult because the terrain is harder to navigate, but it's also the most picturesque, um, you know, because it goes all along the coastline. And it's, it's, it's very beautiful. Um, most people start in either Sarria or Lugo, which is inland to the, the this, let me go back to the map. So Lugo will be right here. Um, in Sarria, it's, it's similar. So you, they start in Sarria or Lugo, which is about 62 miles east of Santiago, which takes about a week to do. So what people will choose is they'll, you know, most of them will do that, that last stage that we call it. But then other people don't want to do the last stage or they've already done the last stage. So they'll do one of the interim stages for a week, you know, depending on sort of what kind of hiking they want to do, what they want to see around it while they hike as well. And what are you going to eat in in Galicia, which is the, the region where Santiago is? Well, you're going to eat pulpo a la gallega, which is... Um, octopus a la gallega so it is a traditional galician dish made by cooking octopus potatoes and sweet paprika powder and it's all cooked in copper cauldrons um <clears throat> the cauldron they impart a unique flavor to the dish and and it is said that it's impossible to obtain that kind of flavor with any other kind of cooking material it's actually not uh, chewy, if you're thinking uh, calamari or squid, it's not chewy at all. It's actually very tender and buttery. It's one of my uh, favorite foods in Spain. And um, bogavante, which is what we call the uh, lobster with this uh, the lobster with the big claws. And as you can see, it's got a different color than the lobsters that you buy here because it's actually a different species um of lobster so it's got a very unique um uh, flavor it's got it's very very flavorful the, the claws are very good meaty as well um so you you have to try it because it will i guarantee you it will taste like no other lobster you've ever uh eaten again just like the shrimp in sevilla 
here we you know we boil the lobster we eat the lobster you don't need sauces or butter or anything because the meat has so much flavor in it and then this this is it this is it for my presentation these are these are my people you know we we love to eat we love to drink we love to laugh we we love to dance and we would love for you to come and dance with us a little bit